The Art of Paul Reed, Color, Creativity, Curiosity, by David Gariff. Paul Reed, at the age of 91, continues to make art in the basement studio of his Arlington, Virginia home. The studio opens up to the light and colors of the landscape behind his house, a gentle descending slope through trees to a small tributary of the Potomac River. Reed spends as much time outdoors as weather permits. His most recent paintings, washes and drizzles of paint stained on unstretched raw muslin, illuminate the rooms of his house. Attached to, the, to his windows, they create a vision of modernist stained glass that serves to unify and blur distinctions between interior and exterior, light and color, art and nature. As if in homage to Matisse and Rothko, light and color enliven this domestic space and present a personal microcosm of the defining nature of Paul Reed's artistic world. There is no more revealing setting to illustrate the goals and ideas that have motivated Reed's lifelong devotion to the art of painting and his endless exploration of the many and varied properties of color. This in no way diminishes Reed's accomplishments in sculpture, photography, printmaking, graphic design, and computer-generated imagery, all of which are part of a continuity of thought and an endless curiosity about art. Paul Reed's journey is a long one. A native of Washington, D.C., he is best known as one of the original artists of the Washington Color School. As with many artists, Reed's career is characterized by many twists and turns along the way. After briefly attending college at San Diego State College in 1936 and the Corcoran School of Art in 1937, Reed found his way to New York City and employment as a magazine illustrator and graphic designer from 1942 to 1950. Reed's time in New York during the 1940s coincided with the emergence of abstract expressionism. The achievements of New York school painters Jackson Pollock, Willem de Kooning, Franz Klein, Barnett Newman, Mark Rothko, and Clifford Still made a lasting impression on him. Reed returned to Washington in 1950 to open his own freelance graphic design firm. His long-standing friendship with the painter Gene Davis who Reed had known since junior high, continued, and the two men were frequent visitors to the National Gallery of Art and the Phillips Collection, as well as to a host of smaller private galleries then thriving in the area. Speaking about Gene Davis, Reed states, quote, My chief stimulation in art at that time came from Gene Davis. We talked, exchanged books, saw each other often. He is an intelligent man, and his ideas were always interesting possibly of more meaning to me than his work was at the time." Unquote. Another formative influence on Reed was the local artist, curator, and teacher, Jacob Kanan. Kanan was an important conduit of information about abstract painting in the New York School for all young Washington artists at the time. In 1952, Reed turned his attention to painting. The influence of the American abstract expressionist shapes this early work. These small-scale experiments in oil, watercolor, enamel, and gouache on paper or masonite, Alpha from 1952 and Platform One from 1956, for example, are fluid and loosely painted in keeping with the spontaneity and vigor of the New York School. Platform One also explores the tension between a painterly field and a geometric form descending from the top edge of the frame, similar to the push and pull of tensions in paintings by Hans Hoffmann and Robert Motherwell. This dialogue between color and structure, active and static elements, would become an important part of Reed's vocabulary in later works. Also of importance for Reed at this time were the Flag and Target series by Jasper Johns that had recently burst on the art scene. The flag paintings appear to read as a daring venture with their edge-to-edge -edge treatment of an iconic image and caustic surfaces and color alterations. With the availability of commercially produced acrylic paints, both magna and acrylic resin paint, and water-based acrylics in the 1950s, Reed began to explore the properties and working methods of staining or soaking colors 
into unprimed cotton duck canvas. Here he built upon techniques already pioneered by Morris Lewis and Kenneth Nolan in Washington, who in turn had witnessed the stained paintings of Helen Frankenthaler in New York in 1953. The seminal Frankenthaler picture in this evolution was Mountains and Sea from 1952. By 1959, Reed was engaged in the staining process, allowing water-based acrylics to bleed and fuse into the surface of the canvas and respond to gravity in, to create floating, luminous, and optical fields of color. The center of the canvas is of particular importance in Reed's first stain series, Mandela. Mandela is the Sanskrit word for circle. In works like number 27 from 1962, and 12C from 1963, the circular designs of color appear to radiate outward from a central core. Centrality is reinforced by the square format of the supports, three feet by three feet and two feet by two feet, respectively. A feeling of expansiveness and luminosity characterizes these paintings as seemingly disembodied colors appear to shift and pulsate. One thinks of Kenneth Nolan's Target series but in Reed's Mandela's paintings, it is as much about outward movement as inner focus. In both series, color interactions are at the heart of the effects, and lessons learned from important color theorists Josef Albers and Ilya Bolotovsky underpin the works. It was clear to many in the art world that something important was emerging from the painters in Washington, D.C. Much of the activity centered on the Washington Gallery of Modern Art near DuPont Circle, one of the first galleries devoted to contemporary art in the city. Established in 1961, the gallery officially opened to the public in November 1962 with a posthumous retrospective of Franz Klein's work. Many New York school painters, including Helen Frankenthaler, Barnett Newman, and Mark Rothko attended the opening. The first director, of the WGMA was Adeline Breeskin. Among the shows organized during her tenure were exhibitions devoted to Arshiel Gorky in 1963, Ellsworth Kelly in 1963, and Vincent Van Gogh in 1964. In June 1964, Gerald Nordland succeeded Breeskin. In 1965, Nordland curated an exhibition titled The Washington Color Painters. It featured paintings by six local artists considered the seminal figures in the new painting emerging from the city. The artists selected were Morris Lewis, Kenneth Nolan, Gene Davis, Thomas Downing, Howard Meering, and Paul Reed. The stage had been set for this exhibition the previous year when art critic Clement Greenberg organized an exhibition for the Los Angeles County Museum of Art titled Post Painterly Abstraction. The Los Angeles show, a larger, more inclusive exhibition, featured the works of 31 painters, including most of the Washington artists mentioned above. Four years before the Los Angeles exhibition, Greenberg had recognized the artists in Washington as the heirs to the first generation abstract expressionists in New York. He stated in reference to Lewis and Nolan, quote, who both live in Washington, D.C., which fact is not unrelated to the quality of their work. From Washington, you can keep in steady contact with the New York art scene without being subjected as constantly to its pressure to conform." Unquote. Paul Reed's first one-man exhibition took place in 1963 at the Adams Morgan Gallery in Washington, D.C. It included Mandela paintings number three from 1962, and number 23 from 1962, among others. Howard Marion, in the introduction to the catalog, described how patterns, quote, move and play freely or converge on a center gently touching and overlapping. We catch their joy and their sense of play, their friendliness, unquote. Reviewers referred to the, quote, singing beauty, unquote, of the paintings, recalling the paper cutouts of Matisse, and to their Art Nouveau rhythms. Reed repeated the Adams Morgan success with a one-man show in East Hampton, New York at the East Hampton Gallery. 
a one-man show at the Jefferson Place Gallery in Washington in January 1964, and the second one-man show at the East Hampton Gallery from November 30th to December 19th, 1964. Barbara Rose perceptibly addressed one of the criticisms of Reed's work at this time, its decorativeness. She writes, quote, The danger in this kind of work is that it may tend to look like applied art if the composition can be read merely as design. By this, I do not mean it is decorative in any pejorative sense. A painting can be decorative and still be good art as well. But in spite of these drawbacks, I see considerable potential in Reed's work which has, none of, which has nonetheless a fresh and engaging quality. Debates about the decorative pleasures of painting have long been part of the discussion on Matisse's art. Reed is close to Matisse in his belief that, quote, all good painting comes from previous painting, unquote, and strives for, quote, beautiful color that produces pleasure, unquote. As such, Reed's outlook is related less to the formal strictures of Greenberg and more a reflection of Matisse's desire for an art of balance, purity, and serenity. An aspect of Reed's formal language at this time was his use of biomorphic forms reminiscent of Miro and Arp. He refined the treatment of the mandala into eight biomorphic petal shapes floating around an open center. A dark wedge also cut the square canvas across one corner. He sacrificed fluidity of movement in favor of a more precise arrangement of hard edge shapes emphasizing strong color contrasts as in number 17 from 1964. The exhibition, The Washington Color Painters, opened on June 25, 1965. Eight works by Reed, including the above mentioned number 17, were in the show. All were acrylic on canvas. Writing about Reed, Gerald Nordland stated, quote, Paul Reed has followed the most heartfelt dogmas of the color painters and has carried some further than any other. He is the only painter who continues to explore the possibilities of transparency, which were set out originally by Morris Lewis. He has carried the centralized image, possibly derived from Nolan, through an elaborate and felt metamorphosis involving target-like amorphous structures which become a series of eight forms suspended on a field of saturated color. The forms were forced backward by means of complementary colored dots superimposed upon them and have now changed again into an opaque disk with the same potential for interaction which the eight jigsaw forms had before. The artist's most recent works involve transparent color in its most interesting new applications." Unquote. Nordland's reference to an opaque disc calls attention to Reed's new disc series begun in 1964. These water-based acrylic paintings on unprimed canvas ranging in size from 24 inches by 18 inches to 7 by 9 feet became the focus of a one-man show at the Corcoran Gallery of Art in 1966. Works in this series include number 1D from 1965 and number 4A from 1965. By this point in Reed's development, one already discerns an artist of extreme refinement and intelligence. He is sensitive to color, shape, visual dynamics, asymmetrical balance and surface. Moving quickly from, from a flirtation with the muscular, gesture-driven works of the New York School to the more surface-oriented works of Rothko, Newman, and Still, to the stained paintings of Frankenthaler, Reed nonetheless creates a visual language stamped with his own personal and expressive qualities. Along with his colleagues in Washington, he is deeply engaged in his materials, in the free-flowing nature of acrylics, and the absorbency of raw canvas. He senses the discipline of his graphic, one senses the discipline of his graphic design experience, contributing to the meticulousness of his paintings. He works with patience and diligence through his ideas, often beginning with numerous sketches and small scale experiments, at least 40 in preparation for the disc series. 
Reed's Upstart series began in 1966. He featured a number of these paintings in a one-man exhibition at the Bertha Schaefer Gallery in New York late in 1967. Works like Interchange from 1966, Intersection from 1966, and Coherence from 1966 marked the departure to bands of hard edge color moving in a zigzag fashion or creating a grid across the white field. Reed's own account of these paintings mentions the influence that Jackson Pollock's Blue Poles, number 11, from 1952, had on him. He was looking to create his own version of cadence bands across a horizontal surface. Some of the paintings in the series took on a vertical format, however, appearing to rise up from the base. The wall sculptures of Donald Judd from the 1960s come to mind when looking at these paintings. The stacked modular design, systematic incremental feeling, horizontal and vertical balance, color relationships, and strict construction principles all appear relevant. It seemed logical after the Upstart series for Reed to begin to experiment with altering the shape of the canvas itself. Reed refers to this body of work as his, quote, geometric abstractions, unquote. They are among his finest works and include such well-known paintings as Emerging, number 11, from 1967, Topeka, number 6, from 1967, Hackensack D., from 1967, Zigfield A from 1967, and Barcelona III from 1969. The late 60s saw Reed explore the aesthetic possibilities of welded steel sculpture. Reed created the designs with the actual cutting and welding executed by his friend Bill Truitt, a professional welder. Here the crisp design, complex geometry, modularity, and repetitive rhythms hold forth in three dimensions, as in Step from 1966 and 8A from 1967. Sharp, straight edges play their part, but more interesting is Reed's engagement with the dynamics of convexity and concavity. What is noticeably absent is color, a Reed trademark. Given the structural quality of Reed's painted geometric abstractions, the lack of dialogue between the two media strikes one as a missed opportunity, more so when we recall that a major preoccupation throughout the career of David Smith was painted steel sculpture, especially from 1960 to 1965. The Gilport series occupied Reed in the early 1970s. Here he returns to the center but in a new way. One can read the distinctive shape as an octagon split open in the middle. It can also read as two trapezoids floating in dynamic tension near each other. The painted versions of the Gilport series consist of two separate, unstretched canvases pinned to the wall at specific coordinates. As in paintings by Lewis and Nolan, the white space is as important as the colored areas. Embedded in the Gilport series is a subtle and complex series of mathematical ratios and proportional schemes worthy of Piero della Francesca or Georges Seurat. The eye and the intellect of the viewer must harmonize in order to derive the full pleasure of the experience. This precise blending of intellectual and sensual experiences is a hallmark of all of Reed's paintings and one of his greatest strengths as an artist. From 1962 through 1971, in addition to his activities as an artist, Reed served as director of graphics for the Peace Corps. In 1971, he was appointed assistant professor at the Corcoran School of Art, a position he held until 1981. The Corcoran period saw Reed investigate the expressive potential of oil pastels on paper, utilizing a more automatic and spontaneous technique he often combined drawings executed on different days to create diptych and triptych ensembles as in Untitled, 
12-23-79-1PV, 12-24-79-1PV, 1979. The initials PV in the above title refer to Paradise Valley, Arizona. Throughout the decade of the 1970s, Reed was a frequent visitor to Arizona. He was artist in residence at the Phoenix Art Museum in the winter of 1976. He was also a visiting artist at Arizona State University, Tempe, in the fall of 1980. His paintings had been exhibited in a one-man show at the University Art Collections at Arizona State as early as 1971, and his work was regularly seen at the Yaris Gallery in Scottsdale between 1978 and 1981. The printmaking department at Arizona State during this period was one of the most innovative in America, centered on the Arizona State University Print Research Facility established in 1978 and boasting such artist educators as Jules Heller, Leonard Lair, and master printer Joseph Segura. Reed's time at Arizona State and collaboration with Segura ultimately led to a body of work known as the gouache paintings. These complex works are created through a combination of painting and offset printing using opaque watercolors and inks. The resultant form spread across the surface in a dialogue between scraped and free-flowing color. The following years witnessed an expanded range of artistic preoccupations, a natural curiosity that leads beyond the strict parameters of color school painting. Notable is Reed's exploration of the interrelationships between and among painting, printmaking, photography, and computer imagery. In series from the 1980s, such as the quad photos and the mosaic photos, Reed reintroduces nature and the world into his art, but not without a continued reordering and reflection upon a host of strictly formal principles, including geometry, color, scale, and the mechanics of art and vision. In the photo series, Reed plays with juxtaposition, superimposition, inversion, and mere imagery, creating collage-like effects. The quad photos, LACT Globe, Arizona, from 1982, for example, contrast man-made structures with natural forms, a car with a flower, a building, and a mountain, to encourage formal and thematic dialogues between the two images. The mosaic photos, National Gallery, Smith, 1985, create wide-angle views of interiors and landscapes that force the eye to see the parts and the whole in both a sequential and panoramic way. Like many artists, Paul Reed often returns to methods, motifs, and themes from his past, reinventing and recontextualizing them to create new works. In addition, like many artists, inspiration comes from many places, including the art of the past. By the year 2000, a new motif appears in Reed's work. It is a grouping of flat, rectangular bars in various numbers that appears to hover above the picture plane, moving in a diagonal direction. Reed describes the form as resembling a, quote, hand, flag, sail, or raft, unquote. It is reminiscent of the rectangles in many of Kazimir Malevich's suprematist paintings in which geometric shapes float in precise tension across the surface. Unlike the severity of Malevich's paintings, however, Reed's forms, how, ho, forms hover above a variety of fields from the painterly to the photographic. The motif is an elaboration and enlargement of a scratched hatching element found in some of Reed's paintings from the late 1990s, such as Algenib No. 3 from 1996. In all cases, the motif serves to heighten the effects of spatial illusionism. Reed paints the rectangles in a variety of ways, 
thinly, thickly, unified as a platform shape, as in Dene 2000, separately as individual elements, as in Cry L from the year 2000, working in unison or engaged in conflict, as in Amara from 2001. He has also built sculptures comprised of wooden slats that mimic the form and hang freely like a mobile when suspended against various backgrounds, including nearby paintings, the shadows of the form superimpo the shadow of the form superimposes itself to create new works that change with the air currents and ambient light. Finally, he has gone back to literally superimpose the shape onto earlier paintings, photographs, and computer prints, thereby reinventing and bringing fresh life to old works, as in Bofedora, 1984. Paul Reed continues to add to a prolific body of work already distinguished for its quality, originality, and art historical significance. Those of us who live and work in the Washington, D.C. area as artists, curators, art historians, art educators, critics, and art lovers owe a debt of gratitude to Reed for the enrichment his art has brought to us and to our city. His paintings represent an important chapter in the cultural history of Washington, D.C. and deserve celebration, documentation, and preservation. In this light, Paul Reed's story cannot conclude without mentioning the plight of modern and contemporary art in Washington. The city's history of neglect of local artists and the failure of many of its cultural institutions to support its native talent remains an often discussed but ongoing problem. The art collection that once resided at the Washington Gallery of Modern Art, including important examples of paintings by the Washington Color School and Paul Reed, today forms the core of the post-war and contemporary art collection at the Oklahoma City Museum of Art. In February 1997, an exhibition consisting of 24 works of Paul Reed's paintings, sculptures, photographs, and prints created between 1961 and 1996 opened at the Watkins Gallery at American University. At the conclusion to his catalog essay, the director of the Watkins Gallery, Ron Haney, wrote, quote, this overview of Paul Reed's career has been all too brief, the size of our gallery limiting the number of works we could include. There are many areas which a larger gallery or museum might investigate with a more in-depth retrospective, unquote. That more in-depth retrospective has yet to take place. Writing about the American University exhibition in the Washington Post, Benjamin Forge addressed what he called Washington's second city syndrome and the demise of the Washington Color School. The subtitle of his article was, quote, Paul Reed gets a long overdue show in his hometown, unquote. It is exciting to think that this current exhibition of works donated by Paul Reed to the Georgetown University Library might serve as the catalyst for the long overdue and much deserved museum retrospective that the late Ron Haney called for in 1997. Falling short of that goal, however, we take solace in this less grandiose but sincere tribute to an artist of remarkable gifts and generous spirit. <laughs>